Hi, I'm Ben Mercer. I'm a former rugby player turned author, and this is my first book, Fringes, Life on the Edge of Professional Rugby, all about my experiences playing lower tier rugby in France. The book became an Amazon bestseller and was long listed for the Sports Book of the Year in 2020. And I'm going to read the introduction and chapter one to you now. Introduction. Athletes, maybe even more than other people, depend on the myths they can tell about themselves. Benjamin Markovitz. We all tell our own story. Look at a block of flats and you'll see a thousand souls all starring in their own drama, telling and retelling their own lives. I moved to France to continue my professional rugby story. I'd given England a bash and hadn't made the top division. This was a bit of a last go, a chance to do something different, live somewhere I'd always wanted to live. French rugby always held a romantic appeal for me, the laissez-faire approach to life, learning the language and the thrill of jouer when everything comes off miraculously. Famous French wins against the All Blacks in 1999 or even heroic defeats like the World Cup final in 2011 the European dominance of the swashbuckling Stade Toulousain in the 2000s, with homegrown players slinging the ball everywhere, their insouciance combined with the sheer joy of playing so expressively. My years there did give me these experiences. I learned the language, threw the ball around and lived with a degree of insouciance for a while. Later, things began to rub against me, shaking me out of my complacency, and I began to question what I was doing there. The team began to think the same thing. This story is about the things I learned or didn't learn during my career. How professional rugby works. And what you do when you realise that what you're doing isn't enough for you anymore. What I'll tell you about in this book is not necessarily right and others who are there could disagree. The events I describe are true to the best of my recollection. And how I feel about these things may be tempered by time and perspective a gradual shaping of my own history. I'm now retired from playing and don't necessarily miss it. I'm not beholden to sensitivity or reputation in the way that a higher profile player is, although I will withhold some details to save potential embarrassment or just to do right by some of my former teammates. My gay teammate doesn't need outing by me, even if he was happy for everyone at the club to know about him. My teammates taking drugs don't need naming, even if they may not still be playing. To know that these things happen in the context of professional sport is insight enough. Some of the insights may be easy to dismiss as things that only happen at a lower level, not at the more rarefied echelons of the game. I can tell you that many of these things are universal and that money doesn't make people essentially different. It just gives them greater resources to indulge their similar impulses. Where top players vary from the likes of me is in the diversity of their experiences. They play the same teams every year. They visit the same stadiums every year. They play against the same guys, by and large, every year. A guy like me has a far more diverse range of rugby experiences, and in this book, I'll attempt to communicate them to you. I gained an English literature degree before embarking on my professional rugby career proper, and I've always fancied the idea of writing a book. Infrequent attempts at writing things up to this point have been me paying lip service to this idea, but perhaps not really believing in it. The pages of a book are an easy place to fail, and I became someone scared to fail, both on the field and away from it. Simultaneously, I've regarded myself as something of a scholar-athlete, finishing my studies and continuing to learn while I've been playing most notably by learning French. This book is partly me justifying my self-proclaimed status as a platonic scholar-athlete, partly a way of showing you what's behind the curtain of professional rugby in another country. Stories can keep us alive and moving forward, even as they exert a pull back into the past. In sport, you're always looking back at where you've come from, what you've just done, and at what's coming next weekend. But you never feel more alive than you do in the moment, on the field, where you can forget about everything else. 
That's why we all play. Crafting our own story is something we do every day, with everything we do. Here, I'm writing my own history. Moving to France wasn't an attempt at writing history. I just didn't have a job and felt that this could be my next adventure. That adventure became something unique and special, being a part of building a new bastion of rugby in a non-traditional rugby region. Now, that adventure's over, but I get to tell my version of it here. I hope you enjoy it. Year one, crossing the channel. When the ball I passed hit my winger in the face, knocking him over and halting the session, I looked around at the desolate training pitch in the French public park, at my motley collection of new teammates in a random array of training attire, and thought I'd made a big mistake. I'd signed for a year at Stade Rouenet, a project team with wealthy owners and lofty ambitions in the north of France. The aim was to create a new rugby power in the non-traditional rugby region of Normandy. Judging by our first session, this aim was not a realistic one. Realism was something that was beginning to permeate my view of rugby as a career path. I'd spent a couple of seasons as a second division player for Plymouth Albion in the RFU Championship, the second tier of English rugby, taking a short break in Sydney before pitching up at the Cornish Pirates and was now beginning to take stock of my options. I'd been an ambitious young player, deferring my plans to pursue professional rugby to attend university and get the security that came with a degree. The utility of my English literature degree is up for debate, but credentialism and the need to justify my decent school grades played their part, as well as my desire to leave home and experience the university lifestyle. Upon graduation, I immediately decamped to Plymouth for two seasons, fabricating a holiday so I could spend a week in the gym sweating out my final university excesses before arriving for pre-season. After two years in Devon, I headed to Australia for a couple of months, which turned into almost a year, before heading back to the UK where I saw the Pirates as an opportunity to restate my claims of being a good enough player to reach the Premiership. Rugby is not a good option as a career path, even if you avoid serious injury, your career will be over in your 30s and the average premiership salary is about £150,000 a year. There are only 500 or so of these contracts, making getting one extremely competitive and I'd wager that this average salary is heavily skewed by the top end of the market, where some guys will be receiving up to half a million pounds per season for their efforts. A select few are now getting more than that. There's also the matter of your position. If each team had four players in each position, then you need to be in the top 50 players in yours to get a deal. With hundreds of thousands of registered players in the UK, as well as talented foreign players being readily available, the odds are not in your favour. The Championship is far less well remunerated, while offering you little to no job security. Most deals are one year long, and are liable to be snatched away from you if injury suddenly makes you unavailable for any substantial length of time. As an outside back in my mid-twenties, I was no longer a young player, but almost a mid-career professional, and unless something changed for me quickly, my youthful dreams of the top level of the sport would remain just that. Demographics are against you in rugby, and securing a contract in the championship that pays you a livable wage is no mean feat. Extending the statistics quoted above means that you're probably in the top 100 players in your position in the country if you're playing in the championship, yet this is not enough to guarantee a living. Many contracts are less than £20,000 a year, while some are as little as 6000 You can be in the top 100 in your profession and feel like a failure. I tended to earn reasonably in the championship through incentivised contracts and keeping my living costs down, but I by no means felt like I'd made it. To me, that meant getting to and staying in the top division, with all the advantages that brings. I'd not enjoyed my time at the Pirates. Accumulated fatigue and a raft of players and coaches moving on had disrupted one of the more exciting teams to play for over the previous few seasons. 
This French offer had come out of the blue, and I'd been seriously questioning for the first time whether professional rugby was a sensible choice for me anymore. Essentially, my options were go to France, find another RFU championship contract, or consider whether playing rugby any longer was a sustainable option. Choosing to take a leap into the unknown, I packed two bags, made sure I had my boots and gum shield, and caught a flight to Paris. We were quickly thrown into training, and I just knocked over this poor chap with my pass. I'd pitched up at far-flung rugby clubs before, but this was an offsetting experience, testing my capacity for optimism. Limited funding and poor facilities were par for the course at Cornish Pirates, but the paucity of this first training session, in amenities and quality, was a shock. When arriving anywhere new, you're always a little wary, expecting surprises and trying to keep an open mind. What awaited me in France was not quite what I'd imagined, and keeping an open mind was harder than I'd thought. For this session, we'd made our way to some playing fields opposite the football stadium, situated on the outskirts of the city, but easy to find from our accommodation. France is replete with Les Stades, ranging from an actual stadium like the Stade de France to public facilities all over the country. Most of them are open to le public, who can come and use the facilities, and we would often have people running around the athletics track that surrounded the playing surface at our home ground. The stad hosting this training session was at the lower end of the sophistication scale. The training session was also at the lower end of this scale, consisting of a melange of A and B team players. The winger who tried to catch my pass with his face was nicknamed Lapineau, according to his physical resemblance to a startled bunny. He went down like he'd been shot, after letting the spinning ball fly right between his hands. I hadn't been expecting to find Toulouse quality players and facilities, but this first training session was really quite something. Beyond the football stadium lay the motorway which would take you to Paris. I did briefly consider continuing on after training and going home, but that moment of darkness passed. The football stadium itself had a melancholic air. Le Stade Robert de Achon seats around 12,000 people, with one large stand on the west side of the field reaching up and up, giving a good view of the field and accommodating a reasonable number of corporate boxes, a necessity in modern-day professional sport. The other sides of the ground are smaller, but probably closer to the field, which is surrounded by the metal cage typical of many European sports grounds. FC Rouen were once a reasonable side, spending much of their professional history in what's now Ligue 2. To cut a long story short, they made it back to Ligue 2 after a period in the lower divisions, before getting relegated and suffering serious financial trouble, casting the club to the nether regions of French football where they currently reside. At the time of our arrival, the stadium was locked up and not used, the football club playing their matches on what would have once been an adjacent training pitch. We didn't even train on these, instead crossing the road to the public stad and setting up a session where the quality was frankly embarrassing. I really thought I'd made a bad call. Yeah, so Fringe is available on Amazon and Audible, and you can also buy it directly from my website. There'll be some links below. And yeah, if you have any questions, please just get in touch with me on social media and like and subscribe and I'll do some more reading.